is a presentation that I gave at the SEG annual meeting in Denver in 2014 uh, about the fidelity of time frequency representations. I tried to give some of my motivation, which is mostly geological, but also a sort of teaching motivation. And, uh, and after that, it was mostly questions, actually. I uh, had some questions, really, for the group about Gabor's uncertainty principle, um, what constitutes a good time frequency representation. So in other words, what do we mean by good? Um, some ideas about different ways of showing time frequency representations, uh, mostly not my ideas, <laughs> and uh, some ideas around a synthetic benchmark and something that I think we could uh, use to, to learn more about what we want from um, spectral decomposition algorithms when uh, pertaining to seismic. So my motivation is mostly, um, you know, I want to use spectral decomposition to learn something about the thing that the signal's coming from. So in our case, that's geology. Um, of course, these sorts of techniques of looking across a spectrum, looking at different wavelengths, are very common in astronomy, for example, medical imaging, you know, where we might use X-rays, magnetic resonance, um, positron emission, um, ultrasound, all of these things to learn about different physical properties of the um, the thing in question. Um, and, you know, we've all seen lots of uh, pretty RGB displays of, uh, of seismic data where we kind of map different frequencies to the red, green and blue channels of a colour image. Um, but I, I dare say we're still sort of learning how to best use displays like that and how to interpret them. Um, and now John Castagna at the meeting, he, he actually gave a sort of big discussion of uh, spectral decomposition methods and, and also mentioned the thin bed response. Um, so I didn't dwell on it too much in my talk, but the point is that thin beds give us this characteristic notching in the spectrum, these notches, and the spacing of the notches in frequency is inversely proportional to the uh, to the time thickness of the bed. So, so we might actually be able to learn something about stacking patterns and stratigraphy from the spectrum of the seismic. Now I mentioned uh, pedagogy, and I'm I'm really interested in. Um, uh, essentially helping people learn about this stuff because it, it is not like I'm a, definitely not a mathematician I'm a relative newcomer to to these methods and it's it's pretty hard to unravel these uh, techniques there's a lot of math um, it can be difficult to sort of get out I'm a Python user so I'm looking for the Python libraries to do whatever matching pursuit or um, empirical mode decomposition and things like this and then even when you find them they may be poorly documented and no good examples and so on and so it's quite effortful to reproduce uh, even basic results in a lot of these papers um so i mean i'm to be honest probably the last person to uh, be helping you but for what it's worth i've put all of my ipython notebooks out in a github repository so ipython notebooks uh, as, as you can see here mix text with code and images so everything in here is is uh well a lot of my displays are reproducible um and my github repository is here um github.com slash quinkunk slash time freak uh help, help yourself basically so gabor uncertainty um sometimes called heisenberg uncertainty or it has various other names um, the, the point here is that these three um, these th three quotes are fairly unequivocal about the lower limit of time frequency um, localization. So in other words, how well can we simultaneously know the timing of a signal and its frequency content? And what they say is that there's a fundamental trade-off, just like in um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, there's a trade-off between position and momentum in uh, time frequency analysis and spectral decomposition it's a trade-off between time localization and frequency localization so you can see them using words like fundamental trade-off um, high frequencies are inherently low resolution um, th th there's a limit with which um, we can measure the instantaneous frequency these sorts of things and i actually asked the room who agreed with this and um well, most people kept their hand down, but about five people <laughs> put their hand up. Um, now, in contrast, these are some other quotes, which I think are, are sort of fundamentally incompatible with the first set of quotes. 
which seem to say that under some circumstances we can get around, we can circumvent the Gabor uncertainty principle. And um, there's a couple of quotes here that, that say this, uh, and with these sort of nonlinear um, uh, decomposition methods, nonlinear transforms. And I asked who agreed with this, and John Castagna raised his hand and was, and in the discussion later it emerged, was pretty clear in his mind that there was either no limit or a much lower limit than, than is implied by um, the uncertainty principle. So, so what is that limit? Well, um, that's another thing I found really hard to pin down, and this is, I think, my mathematics rather than a sort of a lack of clarity in the literature. Um, but I can find at least three different expressions and, um, and it's shown here. So like in terms of variance in the middle there or uh, standard deviation at the bottom. And, and I suppose I just need someone who's really good at sums to say, look, okay, when it comes to seismic data, here's what we're gonna measure. Um, here's what, you know, what that means in a spectrogram and uh, here's what the limit is. Uh, and again, if indeed that limit exists. So I feel like as a community, we need to sort of get to the bottom of this. So, so that sort of brings us to, well, what do we mean by a good time frequency representation? And okay, so time frequency representation is a bit of a mouthful and it basically means a spectrogram, which is a, a, an, an image, actually, it's a sort of 2D um, view with time along the x-axis usually sometimes the y-axis and when we're looking at seismic because you know that's the way time goes and let's just say the other axis is frequency and in this case in these Im images it's the, the y-axis so there's a signal at the top left and then three different transforms um three different spectrograms of the same signal uh at the, at the bottom there and on the right and um i suppose my feeling is well they're all good they're all true they're all sort of um real representations in that basis so the short time Fourier transform on the bottom left there um some people don't like because it looks a bit fuzzy and things look a bit smeared out but but on, in the in that basis in that um representation if we take those components and we mix uh, a signal from them out of sine waves we'll get our signal back so it's um it's a good time frequency representation it represents the signal in a faithful way let's say um now there may be some issues with how it's displayed we'll get to that later um and and the same goes for the continuous wavelet transform which has sort of confusingly different um sharpness if you like in time and uh, frequency um, but again, we can combine those components to get our signal back. So it's in its basis, it is a reasonable and true representation of the signal. So I, I think we need to be more precise in our language when we're saying, well, oh, that's not a good time frequency representation, because we need to explain what exactly we mean by that. Like, what's, what's wrong with it? What do we like about it? Can we just not interpret it? Is it somehow um, uh, we don't understand it in some way? Um, it's not useful. Is that what really what we mean? Uh, again, I think as a community, we need to get to the bottom of that. And, and as, just to take that one step further, I think the idea here is that, you know, some things just are not well localized. So we can try and localize them if you want to, but sometimes that's the wrong thing to do. So, so let's look at a photograph of um, some stars. You know, stars are highly localized spatially, so they should be a pinprick essentially in a photograph. Um, but other celestial objects like this galaxy M32 um, is spread out, right? So if if we try to impose some condition of sharpness uh, of it being highly localized, we will um, essentially uh, we're, we're sort of lying to ourselves, right? Um, in fact, its spread outness might be a feature that we're quite interested in. Um, you know, so so to just to make that analogy clear, the spread outness of something in frequency might be a feature uh, of a particular piece of seismic signal that we're interested in. So uh, trying to localize it, um, trying to unspread it, if you like, um, you know, might be a mistake. Now, there's there's other ways. Uh, so the, a thing can be spread out, but we can also sort of spread it out by blurring it. There can be path effects. Um, we may have imprecise measurements. Uh, 
uh, sort, of, sort of quantized measurements, for example, that image with a very low bit depth on the right. Um, and uh, there may be a lot of noise in the image. Um, and what I wanted to say here is that that sometimes doesn't matter. So for an image of a brick wall, it can be pixelated, it can be blurry, it can have low bit depth. But once we've established that we think we might know what it is, right, that it might be a brick wall, um, we can actually make pretty much all the measurements we might be interested in, like the size of the bricks and the width of the mortar and that kind of thing, um, from a very low, from a very poor image. Um, so in other words, if there's not a lot of information in the quote unquote target, um, then we may be able to tolerate quite poor time frequency representation. Now on the right here, we have a photomicrograph, which has a ton of information in it um, at all sorts of scales. And now suddenly um, poor sampling or um, you know it being out of focus or uh, low bit depth uh, matter much more. So what's si what, well, seismic is imaging geology, right? And geology is um, highly sort of has high variance in the sort of vertical direction and perhaps is much smoother in the horizontal direction. Um, so, well, I don't really know where I'm going with that, but I feel like, you know, m maybe there are different criteria um, for seismic and maybe it's even direction dependent. You know, so just to just to sort of finish that thought, I guess, the Fourier transform is a sort of almost like an analogy for a stringed instrument where things, uh, what we choose sine waves um, at particular scales. Um, and uh, may maybe there are other analogies which work work better for, for seismic data, I, I don't know. I think, you know, that's the open question that the workshop was there to address. And, and just to finish that thought about what is good, well, you know, like I say, I wanna be able to reconstruct my signal. Um, I want to be able to, I want to know that the time frequency representation is sort of fair and faithful, if you like. Um, and, you know, so I feel like the reversibility of transforms, if, you know, if we want to talk about what makes a good transform, um, I think the, a demonstrable um, sort of uniqueness and reversibility of the, uh, the spectrogram seem like they might be good criteria. Um, now I, I, st I you know had this idea just like a week ago or something, so I didn't have very long to sort of start pulling it together, which is why this table has hardly anything in it. But <laughs> I thought it might be interesting to sort of start trying to collect some um, uh, criteria for each of the transforms. I put them on my wiki. I'll put these in, in SEG Wiki too, um, just just as a place to sort of collect our learnings and at least point to, for example, Python modules or MATLAB code or whatever that works. So, so what about different kinds of graphical representations? Well, here's a typical spectrogram. Um, this is in my STFT uh, IPython notebook, as I've indicated at the top there. And you'll notice it's slightly sort of fuzzy. Um, and, and I feel like actually there's a tiling of the time frequency um, plane here, if, you know, we can call that uh, the spectrogram a time frequency plane. And, and actually, um, there's a discreteness to these digital signals, even after spectral decomposition, that I think we should represent. Um, so the tiling um, reflects uh, what, what essentially what we're sort of allowed to know, if you like, about the signal. So in the regular time um, domain, we're in what's known as a Dirac basis, where we have perfect sort of time clarity, if you like, and no frequency uh, representation at all. In the Fourier basis, it's just the opposite. Um, and then we have the short time Fourier transform, which splits up the window by sliding a, uh, a, a, a window along the signal, and we get a little bit of time resolution, but we pay for it with some frequency resolution. And then on the right there and at the bottom, we have a sort of fully adaptive method uh, where we're essentially using different, you can think of it as using different length windows or different scales for each frequency. So we get these kind of um, uh, uh, perhaps odd looking tilings. So it strikes me that maybe we should be looking at these things in a sort of uninterpolated way. Um, you know, maybe we should acknowledge the tiling essentially and reflect it in our displays of um, of spectrograms. So I, I, you know, I'm not claiming here that I've uh, done a good job of representing the tiling in a fair way. Um, but I, so all I've done is present a sort of uninterpolated image. 
uh, where we can see the pixels. Um, but I do feel like this is a sort of first step to showing that tiling for any time frequency transform. That's something I'm still trying to figure out. Another thing that struck me is that we tend to throw away the phase information. And I thought, well, actually, we can use the sort of RGB style display um, to sh try and show phase two. Uh, so uh, instead of using RGB, we'll use the HF, uh, sorry, HSV space, uh, and we can map the phase angle to hue because it is a circular property as well. Uh, and we can map the saturation to the magnitude of the, of the complex number. Um, and we'll just hold the value constant as a high number. Um, so we should get nice bright colors where we've got high magnitude and the color will reflect the phase angle. So, so here's that same spectrogram again, and we can see the pixels again too, um, which I kind of like. And, and now we can see the, the phase angle by color. Um, and now, you know, I have essentially no idea what to make of this, but I'm sort of intrigued by it because the colors do seem to change in a systematic way in places. And, um, you know, this is, a, again, something I'm sort of still working on. I'd love to hear what anybody else thinks of this, uh, this display, because as far as I'm aware, it's, um, it's a, a novel display of a spectrogram. And, and just to sort of uh, show what I mean by a sort of uh, the, the funky tiling that you get with these uh, variable scale um, transforms, this is uh, uh, the S transform on a chirp. And uh, as you can see, we get very poor resolution um, in frequency or scale as it is here on the Y axis, um, where the time samples become nice and thin and we can see uh, exactly what the timing is. And here's another example that I just basically grabbed off the internet, um, a sort of intriguing looking display of uh, matching pursuit atoms. And uh, these were, I believe, computed from the scale of the atom and then um, calculating the implied time uh, localization from the Gabor uncertainty principle. And I mentioned a synthetic, you know, I, I feel like, um, Synthetics are great because we know exactly what went into them, but they're not very natural. Um, natural events, on the other hand, are great because they're natural and uh, they're realistic, so to speak. Uh, well, they're real, <laughs> uh, uh, but but we don't know what went into them. We don't know what caused them. So you know, we can look at the Tohoku earthquake uh, signal, for example. Um, but if we don't know very well the physical conditions that led to that signal, then you know, if I'm a person who's essentially trying to solve a sort of inverse problem by looking at spectrograms and saying, what does this mean about the Earth? Um, it's perhaps not the best way to learn about what's in the spectrum. And, you know, and, and therefore I would say to evaluate what makes a good spectrogram. I mean, essentially, we don't know what the features are, the salient features of the spectrogram are. So um, it makes it difficult to evaluate them. So, um, so what, what might a uh, useful or more useful, I would say, um, synthetic look like? Well, I've put some uh, properties that it might have at the bottom here. So we've got naturalistic, uh, so natural-like, um, a complex, multi-scale, just like geology. Uh, and um, if we're going to um, ha have a sort of complete signal, that's to say not just a reflection coefficient series, say, um, if we're going to sort of combine it with the wavelet, then the wavelet should be as natural as possible, perhaps even recorded. Um, we should uh, make sure we add reasonable random noise, again, perhaps recorded noise, and there should be reasonable, uh, realistic, um, coherent noise from, from imaging, say, so with multiples and that sort of thing. So there we have it. Um, I tried to cover these, uh, my motives, Gabor's uncertainty principle, what makes a good time frequency representation, I think, is an open question. Uh, I showed some, some graphic representations, different ones, and um, talked a bit about this idea of a synthetic benchmark. And um, that's the end of my presentation. If you've got any feedback for me or thoughts about it, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening.